دي محطة مصر قلب المدينة كل دقيقة بيطلع منها قطر وكل دقيقة بيوصل فيها قطر This is Cairo Station, the heart of the capital. Every minute one train departs and every minute another one arrives. أنتم تستمعون إلى الديوان. نخيم مازنين لديوانية. ديوانية يدنا مكتسنس. أنتم مكشيبين لي ديوانية. ديوانية يدنا مكتسنس. أنتم تستمعون إلى ديوانية. From the Moshe Dayan Center at Tel Aviv University, you're listening to ديوانية. What you just heard was the opening line of the Egyptian film Bab el Hadid, Cairo Station. The film offers a glimpse into life in Cairo in the late 1950s, a period of rapid social change. And Yusuf Shaheen, the great Egyptian auteur who directed and starred in Bab el Hadid, considered it his masterwork. When you walked into his offices in Cairo, you were greeted with a big blow-up of the scene of him and Hanuma on the tracks. So for all the other films, this was the film that sort of stood out in his own mind. That's Joel Gordon, an expert on Egyptian cinematic history. Joel Gordon, a professor of history and director of Middle East studies at the University of Arkansas. So could you just go through the plot? The main plot. The story concerns a crippled, perhaps mentally infirm newspaper hawker, someone who obviously migrated from Upper Egypt to Cairo at some point in this period of of intense rural to urban migration. Uh, He was taken in by the kindly fatherly owner of a kiosk in the center of the station that sells soft drinks and newspapers, and he hawks newspapers and roams around the station and is kicked and played with and has people who are both detractors and supporters. Uh, And this is his life. We have hints early on in the film that, uh, as the narrator tells us, he's sexually frustrated, which is a theme that's played through throughout. And we see him on occasion during the film taking pinups, advertisements from the magazines that he sells and clipping them very carefully and pasting them around this little hutch that he lives in adjacent to the station. He has a thing, he is romantically, if we can use that word, attracted to uh, Hanuma, who's the sort of unofficial leader of a group of peasant women, the gypsy soda sellers. They sell soft drinks on their own and are being constantly chased by the kiosk owners and the police. And they're attracted to each other in a kind of brotherly, sisterly way. His feelings are obviously deeper. And over the course of the film, he gets more intensely enamored of her, uh, more intensely jealous of her relationship with uh, Abu Sri, the head of the Porter's Union, and at a certain point becomes unhinged. The newspapers that he's selling have headlines about a a serial killer in Rosetta in the Delta, and he uh, sets out to murder her. He winds up uh, attacking one of the other girls by mistake, doesn't realize this. And at the end of the film, grabs her after another back-and-forth scene playful with her and holds her on the tracks. He's talked out of it by uh, Madbuli, the man who had taken him in, and is led off at the end of the film in a, in a straitjacket to a uh, mental asylum. It's a really disturbing ending, for uh, particularly for that period in Egyptian film. What's going on in Egypt at the time that the film comes out? Uh, a number of things, particularly regarding Cairo and the station. The uh, The film came out in 1958, so it's two years after Suez. Suez is four years after the military takeover that overthrew the monarchy. So this is a period in Egypt of tremendous change, a political system that had lost the confidence of virtually the entire population, was overthrown by a group of officers whom were cautiously greeted and then feared and then after the Suez War had become the heroes of independence throughout the region. But the city is changing as well. Cairo is being remade. The engineers are taking over and creating a modern infrastructure. Cairo's it's sort of booming at this point in time and it's becoming in some senses a much more modern city and yet there are all these people this is you know Egypt is, is one of these places where there's one big city that everyone comes to looking for their dreams and the film deals with that in a sense it shows people coming and going and there are a number of peasants who are kind of lost in the middle of all of this Cairo has suddenly gotten so big they they don't quite know where they fit in uh, in all of that Can you talk a little bit about Yusuf Shaheen's attitude towards the city? 
That's interesting because we associate Shaheen normally with Alexandria, which is his city. Shaheen's clearly looking at Cairo as the heart of Egypt and getting away from this sort of Mediterranean coastal, if we want to use the word cosmopolitan, or Levantine Alexandria that, that he would later mourn for. Um, but Cairo is Egypt. It, it has to be in that sense. And so to whatever extent we want to play with people like Kanawi as metaphors for this change, he's put it right at the heart of the action. There's no place else in Egypt you could have, you could have done this. What was he like when you, you met him not long before he passed away? Yeah, it was the summer of 2006. Uh, charming, irascible, <laughs> grumpy, <laughs> all at once. He was tired. He was not feeling so well, I think. He was a little bit rushed. He was a character. I actually called him from the States beforehand. I'd been given his number by a, by a close friend of his, actually, one of the characters in the movie. And I, I called up and he answered. And um, as is typical for many years of making phone calls in Egypt, you're never quite sure that the number goes through to the right place. Uh, and so they say hello and you ask if it's them. And so I said, uh, you know, Yusuf Shaheen. And he said, uh, no, Mustache Van Meganin, uh, the insane asylum. And I think he was about ready to hang up on me. And I had to say, whoa, 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 wait, I, you just heard from uh, your good friend so-and-so about me. Um, he playful, impish. I was there to talk about one film, and I wanted to spend the whole day talking about all of his films. And, you know, dragged him off track, and he dragged me off track at, uh, at certain points. Uh, when he was mad at someone, his tongue was brutal. <laughs> Uh, when he spoke with fondness about someone, uh, he became very poetic. I, I'm very, very, very glad for that opportunity to have sat with him for a couple hours. I wanted to talk a little bit about categorizing this film. Mm -hmm. Which categories does it fit into or sort of fit into? A lot. And that's the wonderful thing about Shaheen. He gets uh, pigeonholed. So first and foremost, we, we talk about it, uh, and everyone has talked about it, as neorealism. You know, looking at the film, particularly of the post-war Italians, shooting on location, out of the studio, with a lot of real faces surrounding us, a minimum of professional actors in this case, Dealing with issues of poverty, issues of social change, showing the grittiness of life through a really close lens. And it fits all of that in that respect. And I think if many people were looking from the outside, you know, without any frame of reference, they might sense that this was basically a film of non-professionals, uh, which it's not, but which it looks like. The other thing, of course, is that it throws elements of classic Hollywood film noir and melodrama. The music is taken from Hollywood films. I lifted, I'll say. I don't know what the rules were back then on all of this. We, we see a lot of that in Egyptian film at this time. There's a lot of dark and light, which looks like film noir. Uh, and then there are these classic, poignant references to particular Hollywood films, which in some respect I think are a play on the entire genre. So we have these posters of the film Niagara about a plot to murder the wife by a jealous husband. Yeah, I think visually it's very noir. The first time we see Kinawi, it's through this piece of warped glass the image of his face is kind of out of distorted. focus yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, and it's much of it even though it takes place during the daytime a lot of it takes place in dark corners so that by the time we hit nightfall it's almost as if we've been at night all the time frame by frame we can see these images also shadow and eyes and then there's social commentary and then there's comedy thrown in it's a film which blends its moods really well this is many films all at once. Let's talk a little bit about the sexuality mm -hmm. in the film. Kinawi and his pinups, Hanuma and her overt sexuality, which is just bubbling over. Some of which is new and some of which isn't. I mean, this is an era, the 1950s, when sexuality is more explicit is a funny word to use, I, I suppose, but uh, it's more openly depicted on the screen. The code in Hollywood was loosening up, uh, although when we still watch films from that period, you have to sort of know what some of the hints are to really understand what the storyline is. Likewise, in Egypt, there is an opening up 
people are oftentimes surprised if they come at this film first time to see the way that people are dressed relative to the images that we have now. To a certain extent, this is a more realistic depiction than some of the studio films, but in films of that time, there's a lot of sexual play that's going on. And so someone like Hind Rostam, with her blondish hair and, uh, and body type, she was known as Egypt's Marilyn Monroe. What's new, I think, is the open, albeit constrained, discussion of issues like sexual frustration, what it means for someone like Hanawi, lame or not lame, to suddenly be thrown into this world of multiple visions of gender, of womanhood, of sexuality, of advertising. So somewhere Shaheen is cautiously but bravely kind of taking apart a lot of these issues and saying things are changing. And then, of course, that gets sort of thrown in all different directions. For example, when the uh, young kids come and get on the train and they're wearing very sort of modern, you can see them maybe heading off to Alexandria and getting into their bathing suits and they're dancing to new rhythms and new beats and this whole world of Kinawi and Hanuma and all of those girls, they're kind of aware of it. They're watching with curiosity. He's watching with a much more intense gaze. And I suppose in the sense that there's the male director dealing with male longings and, and things like that. But it's all over the film. How did contemporary audiences deal with the issue of sexuality and the longing and the sexual obsession? I can guess with a certain amount of discomfort those who would have gone to see this film within the context of just sort of watching other films that were made in Egypt at that time, those who would have gone to see this film with um, more of an attachment to international cinema would have been more probably attuned to these kinds of things. But it's being thrown in their face to an extent. I wish we could go back in time and stand out theaters and, and talk to people. What we have are the, the writings of critics and uh, many of them who become kind of self-righteous and you know, want to put on this mantle of, uh, of nationalism at the time are very critical of Shaheen for show, showing Egypt's warts. These are the critiques that all of these filmmakers globally are getting at this time. They're making great art. They're being recognized internationally for it. There's a lot of pride. And yet at the same time, there's discomfort. Number of, well, more than a number of years ago, uh, I remember on campus going to see uh, Yilmaz Guni's Goal, The Journey, which showed all of Turkey's warts. And the Turkish students were standing outside protesting as we went in. And then they all followed us in to watch the film. <laughs> uh, and they were clearly torn between this feeling of both pride at the recognition of one of their masters and yet that, that discomfort that... Others were seeing these warts that everyone thinks are special to their own society. So who is represented in the film? The different sectors of society and its subcultures? We see right at the beginning, uh, we see a kind of lost peasant. I don't know if he's taking the train for the first time or if he's just overwhelmed by the hustle and bustle of the station. He's trying to get to a, a Delta village and he's treated uh, comically. He can't figure out which line to get into. He's jostled by these guys who are middle class in their Western suits, who are portrayed also kind of comically with the old style Fez or Tarbouche. And later in the film, Kanawi bumps into his wife and he chastises his wife for not veiling. So there's a little bit of peasant culture thrown in, serious with regard to uh, Kanawi, comical with regard to this other one. We see the Effendia in transition, these sort of middle-class bureaucrats, and they're portrayed somewhat comically in their button-down suits, all sweating and buying Coca-Cola. Uh, we see the laborers. This is an important theme of the film, is the uh, efforts by the good porters to unionize. By the end of the film, they've taken their vote and they've won. That's the optimistic part of the film. Uh, we see the young people just having a really good time. They're portrayed very quickly, but very positively. Uh, yes, they're enticing the peasants a little bit, but I think that's shown as, as a kind of uh, exuberant innocence. And Shaheen was very close to the rock band that, uh, that portrayed this group, so I think it was a, it was a kind of nod towards them. And uh, we see one shot of some clerics who look at these young people, and I forget what the line is, but in a sort of classical Arabic, seek refuge from God for all of this uh, innovation or change. And that's clearly a quick swipe. 
what else do we see? Uh, we see men hanging around the station, leering at women. We see some women who are hanging around the station who clearly could be picking up men. Maybe, maybe not, but they're dressed in ways that could be conceived as provocative. And Shaheen may be kind of playing with us here, too, in terms of this sort of changing styles and stylistics. Um, you know, what becomes normative? What's dangerous in a society where there are too many guys sitting around on the steps? We see a young couple who can't fulfill their love interests. She's just looking with sort of her heart broken. So there's a, a storyline there. Globalization is there in the movie posters. It's there in the uh, oh frequent depiction of global soda. We see both Pepsi and Coke bottles. It's hot, and Coke has a sort of already become a uh, vehicle for dating, a vehicle for sexual contact. The pause that refreshes was the phrase at the time for one of them. And uh, Hanuma offers Kenawia a cold soda at one point when he's gazing on her in the train car with very hot looks. And uh, later when she disappears into a shed with her suitor for what starts out as an argument and turns into play and perhaps even uh, playful sex, uh, he's standing with an empty Coke bottle, which he had in a prior scene been twirling around his head in a kind of joyful traditional dance. And now he takes it and smashes it against the wall where the Marilyn Monroe poster is. The issue of women's rights is interesting also there's the women's rally mm -hmm. there's hanuma getting beaten by abu sri right and there is also a lot of catcalling right how would it have been received I think a lot of it would be perceived as normative. Uh, Abu Sari's macho behavior is very familiar to let's take the easy route and say cinema of the time. The macho hero who forces the woman to the ground, you know, in times she's resisting, but it ultimately turns out into an embrace and succumbing. I mean, this is something that we just see over and over and over again, in, uh, certainly in Western cinema. And I mean, in the case of Hanuma, they're in love in their own kind of peasant fashion. You know, our critical lens now would be very sharp, but I think at the time this would be seen as something that's pretty normative. However uncomfortable, we, we may watch it now. I mean, there's this famous scene which is often put into a still of, of her lying in the straw. They've been squirting soda bottles at each other. Shaheen is clearly pushing boundaries with, with a lot of that. And then she falls to the ground and we see the shot of him standing over her and he puts his foot on her leg and she looks up at him, uh, sort of playful longing. The other elements, I think, are there to really make us uncomfortable and to make us think back then as an audience, even now today, about you know what's proper out in public. And so we have groups of guys just hanging around and staring at women in ways that are uncomfortable and I think deliberately designed to make us uncomfortable. And then a bit of playfulness as well on Shaheen's part, because... There's one scene where there's a woman who's kind of walking back and forth. She may be waiting for someone to pick her up, but she's depicted in a low-cut blouse, very well made up, and we're just not sure why she's there and whether their gazes are legitimate if she's prancing to be gazed upon. And then there's that final scene where he kind of reprises that with the young girl who's been left behind and has stayed out way after dark. She's unchaperoned from a social perspective. This is really improper. And he puts her in that last scene up against a lamppost. All the imagery is of a prostitute waiting in the darkness, this sort of film noir to be picked up. And yet her face is clearly the opposite. She's brokenhearted. She's holding on to the lamppost because it's all she's got left. So he's... He's very deftly, I think, taking us from that more familiar, stereotypical, macho relationship into the realm of just sort of the discomfort of this society in flux. You wrote in a paper last year that Bab el Hadid is part of the genre of Egyptian social realism. What made it possible to create films in this style at this point in time? What's happened in Egypt is that the state now owns itself. The king is gone and the colonial power is gone. And so there's a whole reevaluation. A lot of the rules of censorship that were in place have suddenly vanished. There are still tight rules about what 
kinds of sexuality can be portrayed and how religion will be portrayed, perhaps not as stringent as, uh, as we might expect. You can poke fun at religion or religious figures without necessarily poking fun at religion. But for the first time, Egyptian directors can talk about poverty, can talk about labor, can talk about unionization and strikes. This is all part of the forward thrust of the regime. Shaheen is representative of a group of people, directors, as well as a brand new crop of actors, also groups of singers and musicians and artists in general. And they're operating within this free system. And what many of them are doing is really for the first time taking their cameras outside of the studio, not just for that scenic shot of the city. They're actually filming out in the streets. No one quite as much as Shaheen but many of the others are doing it. And so we're getting a picture of an Egypt that we can say is more realistic. The other great director of realism is Salah Abusaif. He does films about crime, about how people are pushed to crime. He has a famous film about these serial killers in Alexandria in the 1920s. Bits of Hitchcock, bits of... These guys never like to be compared. The other one, Kamala Sheikh, is often a sort of gothic filmmaker, romance gone wrong. Again, a lot of shots that are filmed at night inside houses on trains. Taufik Saleh, who, you know, is one of the mystery figures of Egyptian cinema, only made a half a dozen films in his career. They're all considered to be masterpieces. The lid has kind of come off. The only thing that you can't do until the late 1960s is criticize the regime. And sometimes these directors took the convenient out of placing stories either in historical settings or putting them in a kind of timeless, almost fairy tale context where you couldn't say this is the here and now. So what's your favorite scene from Bab al-Hadid? Um... <laughs> That's a tough one. I mean, I've watched the scene by the fountain a million times, and I love the interaction between Shaheen and Hindrost. And that's an easy one, I suppose, to say, because that's really the middle piece of the film. But they are so good. And when he described to me how, I mean, it's such an intimate scene. It, it starts from a distance, it zooms in, and then it pulls out, but it pulls out above him, uh, standing below the statue, and then they have this argument, and then the little boy runs up and kind of breaks the ice, and we see a, you know, we sort of, sort of pan out towards the station. When he told me that, you know, they were surrounded by throngs and throngs of people watching that, I mean, it's, it's unbelievable. And, and what happens in the scene? This is the scene where he, you know, they have this back and forth where she's constantly scolding him for being too pushy, and yet he's the one she can hide her bottles with and, and things like that. So they've had this back and forth. He has uh, spied on her undressing. She was doused with water by her, uh, by her friends in a kind of playful uh, game earlier on, and she goes into the shed, her, into the shed to, uh, to change, and he's watching her. She screams at him and calls out the boys who throw rocks at him, and he hobbles off. Um, he's clearly heartbroken, and they're sort of making up after that. And so they sit down by the fountain. He says, you know, do you have a minute? And she's out refilling her bucket with cold water, and she kind of annoyed says, what do you want? And they sit down together, and he describes to her this life of quiet in the countryside and having cows and children and growing old together. And she and he offers her a piece of jewelry, a necklace, which he says was his mother's, and this is going to be his, his wedding gift to her. And she doesn't slap him away, and she's partly playing with him, and partly in her eyes you can really see that she's sort of dreaming of getting out of Cairo and going back someplace where it's, where it's quiet. And they laugh, he pulls out one of his pinups, and he says, you're prettier than this, and she tells him he's prettier than that. And they get really close. They touch heads, I think his nose almost nuzzles her. And then they're kind of laughing, and it's a wonderfully touching moment. I'm <laughs> not هنا ما تشاوري عقلك وتطوعيني يا عنو أنا بعزك قوي ده أنا شيلك في عناية الاثنين ده أنت ده أنت أحلى من الصورة دي بصي لا أنت أحلى 
<laughs> and then then she snaps out of it and she says i'm in love with abu sri he's twice the man you are she makes kind of reference to his infirmities and suddenly the moment is gone and she walks off now that's not the end yet because she'll be urged by abu sri the uh, her lover to make up with him um and she will that's that scene on the train where she's dancing with the young people and she offers him the bottle of coke as a kind of gesture but then goes off into the shed and that's when he snaps the scene on the train where she's dancing is also wonderfully done because i mean it's just so it's jarring for us in a sense to see these young rock and roll hipsters but she follows them on the train just like she would follow anyone on the train she's handing out coke bottles and this young girl with kind of bobbed haircut entices her to dance along to the beat and she's a little bit confused bemused and her first dance steps are uh, you know kind of traditional belly dance eastern and then gradually she finds the beat and that's where Kanawi comes and then it's broken by someone else calling her lover over and she goes scampering off is there anything you want to add about the film or Shaheen Shaheen is a is, is a figure who fascinates me his studio productions from the early days are wonderfully made studio productions and then from the 1960s on he's it's hit and miss it's eccentric it's films that are designed to at times offend but he's a he's a classic of his generation and i think you know when all is said and done we need to recognize that he did something special out of all this. I guess the mystery for me, and uh, maybe I need to look into this deeper, is why and how he was able to elevate himself beyond all this, at a cost of being seen by many as not really an Egyptian director at times. I think that wounded him very deeply. But I'd like to explore that sort of tension within himself and within Egypt about where he fits in, because he's reflective of of something. It's not really Kanawi. Uh, I think that he's reflective of some sort of in-between passage in the country's history. But I think he would have misread the situation today in many ways, but I wish he was around to misread it for us. Thanks for listening to Diwania, Conversations in Middle East Culture, History, and Politics. Today's show was produced by Shoshi Shmulevets. Listen to more episodes of Diwania at www.diwaniyyya.org. Diwania is made possible by the support of the Moshe Dayan Center for Middle Eastern and African Studies at Tel Aviv University.